in the past few days, we've been hearing of enemies who posed questions to Jesus and had very bad motives. If Jesus had enemies who asked him questions in order to trap him or to use his words against him, he also encountered people who he thought were enemies at the outset but were not. There were also those who asked him sincere questions that were genuinely interested in the truth. You know, sometimes we don't realize how labeling people affects our perceptions of them. The way people in the United States label each other as pro-Republicans or pro-Democrats. Or some people in the Philippines label each other as Dilawan or DDS. Labeling can close our minds to each other. It can prevent us from seeing anything good at all in other people. Well, in today's Gospel, Jesus affirms someone who is called a scribe or a teacher of the law. Madalas mga kontrabida sa buhay ni Jesus. And most likely, he's also with the Pharisees, who asks him a question and gets an answer. He takes the answer to heart, processes it in, in his mind, and then repeats it in his own words, and then even adds his own thoughts to it. Sometimes there are people who pay me compliments for my homilies, and they ask me if they could share them. And usually I answer and I say, thank you for your kind words, but I am just a messenger. It matters more to me that you got the message. Yes, you may share them. I would even appreciate that. Because there is no copyright to the Word of God. The Word of God is meant to be shared. But then, of course, how you share, how you share them, will also speak a lot about you. The easiest way to share in the social media is just to click the share button. Some would even make an extra effort of copying the link and sending it to some individuals. Others would copy and paste the whole message exactly as it was said. That's not bad. But there is no assurance that the sharer actually read the message in full and now wants to share it because he actually understood and appreciated it. You know, one time I remember receiving a message that seemed like a simple pro-life article at the outset. But when I read through it, I was shocked because it was a vicious attack on Pope Francis. And so, the person was surprised when I asked him what he had against Pope Francis. He said, nothing, nothing, I am Catholic. And I said, but why did you share that article to me? Well, obviously, he did not even read it. In my college years, I remember, we were taught that there are different ways of referring to other people's ideas. Two basic ways. One is you can quote them directly and cite your reference. Or two, you can paraphrase what the person is saying, meaning you put it in your own words and still cite the reference. Well, for me, the second option takes a lot more effort. But you know what? It makes for better learning. I often notice that students nowadays, they love to use gadgets when they listen to lectures. Some of them even do an audio or a video recording of the whole lecture. Others go out of their way to take a shot of the slides being projected by the lecturer. Ay yung iba talagang diretsahan would ask for a PowerPoint, a file. 
I wonder sometimes if they are really listening or if they have left the listening to the gadgets. Because if they have, I wonder if they realize that they are actually delaying the learning process that way because they have to replay it all over again. It remains unprocessed. Just because you recorded it doesn't mean you learned it. Nothing beats the value of old-fashioned note-taking. Well, you can also do note-taking on your laptop. But nothing beats note-taking because what you do is you listen carefully to what the teacher is saying, but you do not necessarily write everything word for word. You follow the presentation, you process it in your thoughts, and then you put it in your own words, you abbreviate it using equivalent words, and you note down just the key ideas. In essence, you captured the thought. But you know, your teacher is more impressed when instead of giving it all back word for word, like in a quiz, you make an attempt to paraphrase it, to put it in your own words, because it means you made the extra effort to digest it and to own it. The teacher of the law asked Jesus just one question, and he got two answers. May bonus pa. And I call the answer ang dalawang pag-ibig. The two loves. The first love, very well known to all the Jewish people because they recite it from rote memory from the age of 13. It is called the Great Shema from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is your God, the Lord alone. Therefore, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And then the bonus. The second is this. It's from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. And Jesus also quotes it. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I think the lawyer who posed the question, or the scribe who posed the question, was struck that Jesus had to add a second commandment when he was only asking for the first commandment. He knows that the commandments were written on two tablets of stone. On the one hand, those that have to do with the love of God. And on the other hand, those that have to do with love of neighbor. And what better way is there to explain that the foundation of the commandments is a relationship, a covenant, in which love of God and love of neighbor are inseparable. You see, we can get lost in the many doctrines of religion. Religion can make you turn pharisaical, legalistic, or even fundamentalistic about them. We can get so fixated on the formulation until we become narrow-minded. Some people even invoke Dura lex sed lex. The law is hard, but such is the law. Forgetting how arbitrarily selective we tend to be when we invoke that rule. It is always important to get to the essence of things. And Jesus pinned it, all of it, to love. Love of God above all and love of neighbor as oneself. Kailangan pa bang i-memorize yan? You will rarely find people of other faiths who will disagree with Jesus if they are operating from basic goodwill. St. Paul in our first reading says, The Word of God is not chained. It cannot be chained. It is not bound permanently to fixed words. 
You can paraphrase it. You can put it in other words. As long as the essence of the Spirit is there. Sometimes, I as a bishop, I listen to a guru or I listen to a, an evangelical pastor or I listen to a Muslim ulama explaining some basic principles in their faith lucidly and beautifully. And then I find myself nodding and saying, yes, you're right. It need not mean I am converting to their faith. You're just amazed that you can also hear the Word of God in essence even from people of other faiths. This is not about relativism. It is rather about the power of the Word of God. It cannot be chained. This is what St. Paul is telling us. Like Jesus, whenever you see basic goodwill and an openness to the truth, when you perceive the desire to get to the meat of the faith and its relevance in real life, you feel like saying as Jesus did to the teacher, you're not far from the kingdom of God. Honestly, I've met many people of other faiths or even Christians of other traditions and denominations who are not in our company. They are not far from the kingdom of God. In fact, some of them are probably nearer to the kingdom of God than I am or than some presumed insiders might think they are. Well, if Jesus... If, as Jesus says, love of God above all and love of neighbor as oneself are far more essential than burnt offerings and sacrifice or far more necessary than all the religious obligations, then should we not be disposed at all times to see God's burning bush even in the most unlikely places? Should we not at each time be ready to remove the sandals of our feet because we find ourselves suddenly standing on holy ground?